Ephesians chapter 6. We've been in Ephesians for the better part of six months, and I'm really excited to finish it today. We cover the last seven verses, and uh, we have, for the last three weeks, been studying just this section in chapter 6, verses 10 through the end of the chapter, uh, which describes being battle-ready. If you missed last week or the week before, I hope you will go online and listen to the message, either in video or audio, uh, and review what we've learned. But when we started two weeks ago in verse number 10, we learned that we are in a spiritual battle against an unseen enemy, who though he is unseen and his armies are unseen, they are no less real than visible threats we face. We learned that though Jesus Christ has secured the final victory and will win the final battle on the final day, uh, we will face ups and downs, victories and defeats over the course of our journey. We can contribute. We can be a part of winning victories for our captain and his kingdom as he carries out his redemptive campaign in this world. We don't need to fear the devil, but we shouldn't underestimate or disregard him either. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And God has given us everything we need in order to live victorious. Last week we learned about these pieces of the armor. He's given us truth, righteousness, the gospel, faith, salvation, and his word. And we must intentionally choose every day of our lives to suit up in that armor and to use those weapons and those defenses that have been provided to us. Now today's passage is about our battle strategy for victory. We know Jesus will win the last victory on the final day, but how can we win smaller victories during the days of our lives as we face spiritual battle? Well, in these verses before us, verses 18 through 22, Paul reveals a three-pronged strategy for victory. Let's begin in verse 18. Praying always. Will you say those two words with me out loud? Praying always. That's a clue as to the first prong of this strategy. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak, but that ye also may know my affairs and how I do. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent to you for the same purpose, that you might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. What does our battle strategy look like? What does our march as soldiers in the Lord's army look like? I'm thinking of that old song, onward Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before Christ, the royal master leads against the foe forward into battle. See his banner go. What does going forward into battle look like for a winning believer? Well, there are three prongs to our strategy for victory. Number one, In verse 18, we will fight on our knees in prayer. There is a tendency in our human nature when we know there is a threat upon us to spring into action, right? We've just been told that we've been given this armor and we've got this weapon, a sword, and so we want to spring into action to solve problems and take victories and win battles. But wait a minute, we are told that our fight begins on our knees. The average Christian says, we ride at dawn. Let's go and you'll know, charge uh, the gates of hell and conquer our enemy. That's good that you're uh, optimistic and enthusiastic and filled with zeal, but don't you dare step out into the battlefield without having spent adequate time on your knees fighting in prayer. Now, there is no physical human military campaign that would say, the best way to fight is on your knees, soldier. No, no. But God's ways are different than our ways, aren't they? And God tells us, if you want to fight well, start on your knees. We want to rush into battle. 
and we, and we, we, we get busy. We get busy solving problems and tackling tasks and scheduling meetings and repeat the process the next day, and we're busy. And we sometimes wonder, I think, why we're exhausted, frustrated, stressed out. I wonder if the reason is we're trying to win spiritual battles in our own ability instead of depending on the Lord through prayer. Someone might say, well, I don't have time to pray. I've got to work long hours to earn extra money to pay these extra bills. Okay. And all the time we forget that Philippians 4.19 says, God will supply your needs according to His riches. So maybe prayer would be as effective or more effective a strategy than overtime in covering the needs. You can certainly work overtime if God leads you to, if that's part of His solution, but, but not until you've prayed. We, we think uh, that we've got all these people that we need to see and places to go and people to see and say, you know, I've I got a lot to do. I, I can't take time to pray because I've got to call the principal and straighten the school out first thing in the morning. Then I've got to confront my boss about a problem at work. And then I've got to talk to my kid's coach about getting them more playing time. And then I've got to write a letter to my HOA president to threaten him. And then I've got to uh, call into the talk radio about the people that are ruining the country. I've got a lot to do. I, I got a, you know, a lot of people I need to get to cooperate with my plan for their lives. And we, we want to go and do all this. And yet, Scripture says people's hearts are in the hand of the Lord. He turns their hearts the way He wills. So maybe the better strategy is to spend time on your knees in prayer for those situations and the people in those situations. Someone says, I don't have time to pray. I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And all all these things I do, I do for the Lord. Pastor Tim, they're good things. I know, but we forget. Faithful is he who calls you. He will also do it. It is God which works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. So we're busy, disconnected from the power source. I could push a vacuum around this stage feverishly. Day, day light, dawn to, day, dawn to dusk. But if I don't plug it into the power source, it's not going to pick anything up. My effort is ineffective when it's not connected to the power. And whatever time you will spend doing what you're going to do to fight the battles of this life this week, if it doesn't begin with prayer, abiding, patient, deep, time-consuming prayer, it's going to be powerless we will discover. And many Christians are falling further behind in spite of trying harder because they're struggling to realize that the only hope for our lives is the intervening grace of God, which often comes through prayer. Martin Luther said it this way, I have so much to do today that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. That's how we should see these things. Someone said, you can do more after you pray, but you can't do more than pray until you've prayed. There's lots of things you can do to contribute to the battle once you've prayed. But until you've prayed, there's nothing more than you can do than pray. We, um, we don't pray because we don't truly believe that we are utterly dependent upon God. And what God desires to hear from us is prayers like, Lord, I'm in over my head. I can't do this. I can't solve this. Only you can work in this situation. And God does sometimes put us in situations to get us on our knees and say, Lord, our only hope is you. My strategies will fall short. Lord, please work. Sometimes we are filled with pride and we think we can solve problems through through might. It's like a toddler who says to their parents what some of your toddlers have said to you. I do it myself. You know, it's like, okay, you know, stubborn little brat, prepare dinner by yourself. Uh, Good luck. You know, I do it by myself. You know, it's so naive in their stubbornness thinking that they can do it themselves. And I think sometimes maybe that's how God views us. I would challenge you today to make three commitments concerning prayer. One, have a time that you pray every day. When will that time be? 
Will it be early in the morning before you leave the house? Will it be at lunchtime or at dinner time? Or will it be in the evening instead of social media or instead of uh, binging on episodes of your favorite uh, show? What will it be? Do you have a time that you pray? Do you have a place that you pray? Is there a chair? Is there a, uh, is there a place where you kneel? Is there a quiet spot where you park the car and talk to the Lord? I think for an effective consistent, fruitful prayer life, we need a time every day, we need a place, and we need a list. Lists can become monotonous and, re- and repetitive in an unhealthy way, but lists can also give you a framework to really labor in prayer and not forget some important things to bring to the Lord. I think you need a time and a place and a, and a list. And I hope some of you will commit today during a season when most people are so busy running every direction in the month of December that you'll walk with God through prayer and see God work and meet needs and bring His grace to bear in situations in your life. There are things that we can't accomplish on our own. We can't change someone's heart. We can't convince someone to believe. We can't correct a dysfunctional relationship. We may have a part to do in it, but only God can really bring people to where they need to be. I need to spend another minute in this verse, though, because there's a lot more in this verse than just the importance of prayer. Look at verse 18 again, would you please? Look at all the alls in this verse. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. There's, There's four alls there, and we really get like seven different kinds of instruction about prayer in this, in this verse. I'd like to just quickly mention them. It says praying always. That means praying at all times. That doesn't mean you're always verbalizing your prayer, but it means you're in communion with the Lord all day long. And I would say that that begins with a solid, regular block of prayer that then continues throughout the day. Uh, and, and maybe it looks like this. You're walking through your day and you face temptation. And you say, now, Lord, I need your help right now. Give me grace and strength. Uh, or you walk through your day and a blessing comes your way and you stop and you give thanks to the Lord for it. That would be continuing in prayer. Maybe you meet someone who needs Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so you, you quickly stop and pray for them briefly. Maybe you encounter trouble or or encounter evil in this world, or you hear about a need in someone's life, and so you stop and pray for that thing. We need both, this blocked prayer time and the continued prayer throughout the day. Pray without ceasing. David said, uh, evening, morning, and at noon, will I pray and cry aloud, God shall hear my voice. So pray at all times and use all kinds of prayer. He says, all prayer and supplication, two different words to describe two different types of prayer. You know, there's a bunch of different kinds of prayer. You've got personal requests, which are an important part of prayer. You've got intercession for others, which is an important part of prayer. You've got confession. That's um, Nicole's favorite part of prayer, one she spends a lot of time on. Uh, Just kidding. Um, Confession. She probably never needs to confess. Um, You've got thanksgiving, giving of thanks to the Lord in prayer. Utilize all kinds of prayer. Uh, And then it says that we pray in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit means we're dependent on the Lord's Holy Spirit to guide our prayers, to lift our prayers, to shape our prayers, and to cause our prayers to cooperate with the will of God. Romans 8.26 says, we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us according to the will of God. It says here that we pray watching. That means pray alertly. Jesus said, watch and pray to his disciples. What does it mean to be alert in prayer? Well, being alert means you're paying attention spiritually as you walk through every day of your life. Your senses are tuned in. You're not sleepwalking, numbed by this world's entertainment and uh, late nights and uh, shallow activities. You're not walking half asleep through your days. You're walking with alertness, spiritual perception. You've been in the Word. You've been in prayer. Your senses, your, your antennas are, are cued to spiritual needs. And so then as you walk through life with alertness, you have situations and moments where you say, this needs prayer. And so you pray. Alertness, watching and praying. Uh, it says here that we pray with all perseverance, which means you don't quickly give up when the answer doesn't quickly come. 
Jesus taught to persevere in prayer. Um, Jesus told two parables. One was about uh, this widow who was continually coming back to the judge for justice. Another was a story about a neighbor who needed something from his friend and kept waking him up in the middle of the night, asking his neighbor for food for his friend. And at the end of that parable, Jesus said, I say unto you, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. In other words, keep asking. Why why did Jesus teach that? Does God want to withhold from us? Do we have to wear him down? No. But as a part of God's sanctifying work in our lives and sovereign providential leadership in our lives, some prayers, he says, are going to have to be brought to him many times before they're answered. And that's part of his wisdom. It's also part of how he keeps us dependent on him. And then we pray for each other. At the end of this verse, it says, pray for all saints. One of the greatest things you can do for another Christian is to pray for them. Then Paul says in the opening line of verse 19, and pray for me. Think of this. Paul was one of the greatest Christians ever, but he prayed. He asked people to pray for him. He talked about prayer in all of his letters, and he would often express that he was praying for the believers in cities like Ephesus. But you know what he said even more than I'm praying for you? He said, would you please pray for me? Which should teach us we shouldn't be hesitant or shy about asking other people to pray for us. That's not being selfish. That's being biblical to ask others to pray for you. Um, And it also reminds us that our spiritual leaders need prayer. The apostles constantly asked for prayer for them, specifically in their unique role as spiritual leaders. I think about our church. I think about me, Pastor John, Pastor Nathan, our deacons, our staff. And I think about the fact that we need your prayers. I've had a couple people in recent days express to me just out of the blue with a text that they've been praying or with a note that they've been praying. That means so much to me. It's, it means more than just about anything else you could do or say. I want you to see what John MacArthur said about spiritual leaders in, in uh, his commentary on this passage. It's in your notes. Church leaders are Satan's special targets. The more faithful and fruitful a pastor is, the more his people need to pray for his strength and protection. He is more subject to the devil's schemes to make him discouraged or self-satisfied, hopeless or superficially optimistic, cowardly or overconfident. Satan uses every situation, favorable or unfavorable, successful or unsuccessful, to try to weaken, distract, and discredit God's gifted men in their work. Pray for us, please. And don't just pray at mealtimes for us. That's why we gain weight. Pray pray all kinds of different times. We fight on our knees in prayer. Secondly, we will boldly declare the gospel. This is the second part of our strategy. Verse 19, Paul says, pray for me. What, what, What do you want us to pray for you about, Paul? Do you want us to pray that your ankles will heal because they've been rubbed raw from the shackles in your Roman prison that you're sitting in? Is that what you want us to pray for? Do you want us to pray for your freedom, for you to be delivered from prison? Do you want us to pray for vengeance on those who have falsely imprisoned you? What do you want us to pray for, Paul? Pray for utterance. That means pray for the right words to speak. That I, verse 19, may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds or in chains, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. (coughs) Paul's prayer was for boldness. That he would say the right thing and that he would be bold enough to speak. Verse 19. I love the language in verse 19. Pray that I may open my mouth And then he says that the gospel might be made known. Here's a simple little conclusion you can draw from this language. The gospel doesn't get known by people unless believers open their mouths. Some of us have said to our toddlers when they they groan and moan and grunt, we say to them, use your words. That's what Christians are being told in this verse. Let's use our words. 
Some of us are too timid to speak because we don't have the courage. Others of us don't know what we would say. I hear that a lot. People say, I don't, I don't, I'm not comfortable. I don't, I don't know what I would say to someone. I would give you two answers to that. Number one, if you know how you got saved, you know everything you need to know to tell someone else. You, you learned that Jesus died for you and that there was no hope for your soul without him. And you turn to him and ask him to forgive you of your sin and save you. If you know that story and John 3.16, that's all you need. You can talk to someone. You say, well, I, I want to know more. Well, I'm glad you asked because in the new year, we have a strategy. I would like it to be said that at Bible Baptist Church, not one person is not equipped to clearly articulate the gospel to someone else who needs it. So well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to kick off new small groups, probably 20 of them, in January. And the first four weeks of those small groups, or maybe five, all we're going to do is focus on the gospel. We're going to focus on understanding it, communicating it, and knowing it inside and out. And that not only will be good for our own soul to have reviewed the gospel and deepened our roots in the gospel, which has many benefits, but also will enable us to feel capable of communicating to someone else. And then, a few weeks later, we're going to have a two-day seminar, Saturday and Sunday, where a special guest comes in and just spends a Saturday and a Sunday coaching us on sharing the Gospels with other people, co-workers, friends, neighbors, relatives. I'm telling you folks, this is the only strategy God gives for taking this world for Christ. It's not the politician's job to rescue this world from disaster. It's not the school teacher's job to rescue from this world from disaster. It is witnessing Christians that is God's one and only strategy for leading this world to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Notice verse 20, using our words, speaking, using our mouths. There is an old quote that is sometimes used in Christian communities that I think is unhelpful, though I understand why it's used. It is attributed probably incorrectly to St. Francis of Assisi. The quote goes like this, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. I understand what the quote's getting at. It's getting at the importance of living a life of integrity so that our, our testimony speaks for itself. But saying preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words, is kind of like saying, give me your phone number. If necessary, use digits. Digits are what phone numbers are. You can't give one without using digits. Words is what the gospel is. It is the good news. It is the good words about the fact that Jesus came. I got to tell you something, my friend. No one ever looked at your life and watched how skillfully you operate that lathe on the machine shop floor and said, I want to turn my life over to Jesus Christ because they've preached the gospel with me without, to me without words. No. Sure, you should be a, a, a good worker with integrity before your co-workers, but then you need to speak. You need to use your words. And I will tell you, prayer is often what will precede boldness with our words. One of the reasons some of us are so timid is because we don't become courageous through prayer. Acts 4.13, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. When you spend time with Jesus in prayer, He makes you bold. Uh, Acts 4.31, when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the Word of God with boldness. Prayer makes us bold. Prayer makes us courageous. A lack of prayer makes us timid. In this verse, Paul referred to himself as an ambassador in bonds. He actually said all of us are ambassadors in 2 Corinthians 5.20. We are ambassadors for Christ. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is someone from one kingdom who's been dispatched to a different kingdom to live there for a season and to advance the mission of their home kingdom while there. And that's what Christians are. We are citizens of the heavenly kingdom dispatched to this kingdom to advance our king's mission while we're here. And that's what ambassadors do. I think about a simple little thing 
that we're going to do this Saturday, take these flyers into the neighborhoods. This doesn't require even a lot of courage or skill. You just have to know how to put one foot in front of the other and be familiar with door handles, okay? So you can do this. It's a, it's a little step to lean into the idea that we're here for a mission. We're here for a purpose. We've got to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ, getting the gospel to others. So our, our battle strategy is three-pronged. We fight on our knees in prayer. We will boldly declare the gospel. And third, in verses 21 and 22, as this book wraps up, we learn from Paul that we will do one more thing. We will encourage each other in the battle. We will encourage each other in the battle. <clears throat> Which is to say, you don't fight alone. Nowhere in the New Testament do you see a healthy, growing Christian who is isolated from other Christians. No, no. You always see them in community, growing and contributing to each other's spiritual growth. And we see an example of that here in the pages of Scripture. Verse 21. That you may know my affairs and how I'm doing, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister, shall make known to you all things whom I have sent to you for the same purpose that you might not only know our affairs, but also that he might comfort or encourage your hearts. Paul here is speaking of relationships. And we see a lesson here of the power of personal relationships in the context of the local church. Paul says, I'm sending Tychicus. Now, Tychicus was Paul's companion, on his, one of his many companions, on his third missionary journey. Paul eventually, maybe with Paul or separate from Paul, made it to Rome, where while Paul was in prison, Tychicus helped him with food and clothing and resources. Paul was allowed to have visitors in his prison in Rome, and so Tychicus would visit with him. And I just love the way the Bible describes Tychicus, and I guess I'd just like to say, thank God for people, men and women in Bible Baptist Church and other churches like ours, who have Tychicus-like character. It says he was a faithful minister. The word minister means servant. He was a faithful servant. Isn't that two great character traits you could have as a Christian? Faithfulness and being a servant. I think we need more of that. I think our world, I think our churches need more faithful servants. So many people fit that description in our church. But Christians, by and large, have diminished in their faithfulness because they live such distracted, overloaded lives, shallow lives. They've slipped in their faithfulness in our modern day. And they've also slipped in their ability to serve because we live in a consumer-driven culture, so people show up to a church and they go, I'm here to get served, not to serve. And so we must, we must intentionally develop the spirit of Tychicus to be faithful and to serve and that will encourage others around us. I want to just point out here that Paul is showing us the importance of personal relationships and ministry. The letter <clears throat> of Ephesians would encourage their hearts. But he said, I'm sending Tychicus to encourage your hearts. <clears throat> In other words, the letter is helpful, but the letter's not enough. You also need people with skin on. <clears throat> and the Scriptures are powerful. They are an important part of God's work in your life. But they are to be used in conjunction with a fellowship of believers. That's how you learn. That's how you deepen. That's how you grow. You need the Word. You need the Spirit. And you need the church. You need other believers around you opening their Bibles, lifting up their prayers, speaking into your life. If you read Paul's letters, you see that in every letter he wrote, <clears throat> he was constantly mentioning other people that he was grateful for that were a part of his ministry. And just about every one of his letters ends with this long group of people that he's saying, please say hello to this person who means so much to me. Oh, and this person who's with me wants me to tell you that they love you and are praying for you. And I want to show you, I tell you how grateful I am for this person who's done this. All of his letters have that at the end, including uh, Ephesians here with Tychicus. Um, in Romans 16, 
the last chapter of that letter, he mentions 30 people. Paul believed that these relationships and ministry were an important thing. He said in Romans 1, I long to see you that I may impart to you a spiritual gift. He just had sent them a letter, but he says, I need to see you if I'm going to give you all spiritually that I want and desire to give you. The Apostle John said something similar. He said, I had many things to write, but I will not now write with ink and pen. I trust I shall shortly see you and then speak face to face. I would just make a suggestion for some of you in your spiritual journey. Attending church regularly is a really good thing. The next step is moving from regularly attending to being relationally engaged. And that's where you get into a group. And that's where you learn names. And that's where you carry burdens together. And that's where you pray for each other. And that's where you get to know what each other are struggling with and get to speak into each other's lives and encourage each other. I'm aware of the fact that in this technological day, you can find all kinds of resources online. You can actually find, I don't know if I'm supposed to tell you this or not, you can find far better preachers online than the one you have here today in person. Far more gifted, far more scholarly, far more easy to listen to. But there's something that God designed in the human interaction that cannot be replaced by a device or a screen. And I want to encourage you in this technological day to lean into that. Some of you are watching online today. Some of you are snowed in. Others of you are shut in with health needs. We want you to know we love you and we're thankful for you. Some of you are checking out churches and uh, thinking about coming in person. I just want to say we want to get to know you. We want to have a part in your life. And we want it to be an in-person thing if we believe what the Scriptures say. The Scriptures say that we need to consider one another to provoke to love and to good works, not forsaking our assembling together, but exhorting or encouraging each other. It reminds me of the third verse of that hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers. Like a mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod. We are not divided. All one body we, one in hope and doctrine, one in charity. I would just commend to you the words of Swindoll on this passage where he says, those who are tempted to go it alone in ministry in the Christian life need to stand against that temptation. God has designed us to live in harmony and to grow in community, to refresh others and to be refreshed, to encourage others and to be encouraged, to care for others and to be cared for, to give empathy and receive it, to lead, to love and to be loved, to be accountable, affectionate, vulnerable, and sociable. The word encourage, which is used here, means to give courage. That's the etymology of the word, to give courage. And isn't it interesting and isn't it neat that you, your thoughtful words, your kind gesture can give courage to someone else who is in a spiritual battle? We come to the end of Ephesians and we've learned in this particular section that our battle strategy is to fight on our knees in prayer, boldly declare the gospel, and encourage each other in the battle. And I want you to see the last two verses of the book. Verse 23. Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. There's four words I want to point out to you in those last two verses. Peace, love, faith, and grace. Maybe you want to circle those words. Peace, love, faith, and grace. Aren't those four great words to describe the kind of life you want? To describe the kind of life you hope for others to have? This is the life of the Christian soldier who's fighting on their knees, who's suited up with his armor or her armor, who's encouraging each other along the way, and who is boldly declaring the gospel. God's view and and vision for our lives is that we would march forward with the gospel, in prayer, shoulder to shoulder, with peace and faith and love and grace. In spite of the battle that rages around us, in spite of the threats that intimidate us, peace and love and faith and grace all the way until our final arrival home. 
I hope you'll think about the spiritual warfare we're in. And I'd like to go to prayer in just a moment. And I'd like to just ask you, what would it look like for you to implement this strategy in your life? Do you need to pick a time and a place for prayer? Or create a prayer list? Do you need to um, share the gospel with someone this week? Do you need to encourage someone in your life this week? Or seek encouragement? I would encourage you to implement this strategy. It's our only hope for victory in a spiritual war that's raging around us. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us your word, your spirit, your, your people. And I pray you'd help us to walk closely with you, suited up for battle, on our knees in prayer, encouraging each other, marching forward with the gospel.